Welcome to episode three of Traveling Science. G'day legends, welcome back to Travelling Science, the show that's sharing science with the world. My name's Jesse Crow, and I'm the Travelling Scientist, coming to you today from Melbourne in Australia. I'm a health science communicator, and on this podcast, we interview researchers, doctors, and experts, hearing their stories and sharing their ideas that can help us to live a smarter, happier, and healthier life. Today's guest is Dr. Jared McKenna, a reproductive biologist and science communicator. His PhD research focused on female reproductive health, but Dr. McKenna has a broad range of scientific knowledge, and he loves making the difficult and inaccessible science concepts fun and interesting. For example, I actually met Dr. McKenna recently when he was giving a public lecture titled Fantastic Fallacies and Where to Find Them. And that talk was both informative and hilarious, and I just knew that I had to get this guy on the podcast. He's currently working from Melbourne, but he's originally from New Zealand, which means he's got an awesome accent, and he's got a moustache that kind of makes him look like Super Mario, if Super Mario was Kiwi, and instead of being an expert plumber, he's an expert at our internal plumbing, if you know what I mean. No? Never mind. (laughs) During our conversation, Jared answers questions like why humans have a menstrual cycle instead of an Easter cycle, what even is an Easter cycle, why the Egyptian spiny mouse is so unique, which birth control may be the best, and which animal has the biggest penis size to body ratio, and that answer may shock you. We also discuss ideas like hormonal fluctuations and mood swings, the vagina bible, spontaneous decidualization, getting to know your body, famous gynecologists, and of course, mansplaining. But before we get into today's interview, I'd just like to share a review of the podcast with you. And this week's review is... Still no reviews. Look, I get it, you're all busy. But next time you're leaving your local supermarket five stars because they stock that really obscure Japanese rice that you like, or maybe you're leaving your local pizza place a one star because they won't do a half and half pizza for you. Think about traveling science. Oh yeah, need to give that guy a review. And then go online and write something ridiculous, anything. I really look forward to reading it out on next week's episode. But with that said, let's get into this week's episode with our very special guest, reproductive biologist and science communicator, Dr. Jared McKenna. Dr. Jared McKenna, welcome to Traveling Science. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Yeah, no, awesome to have you. Thanks for coming on. Why don't you start by telling us all where you studied and and what exactly you studied at university? Sure. So I uh, had a very, very windy path um, in university, which I'm discovering a lot of people do have. um, So that's great. I started off doing my undergrad at Melbourne University and uh, with the dream or the goal of becoming a vet, a veterinarian. That sort of quickly changed after I discovered I liked something else kind of over here, physiotherapy, and then realized that I didn't really like that. And then I changed to anatomy. Um, and didn't really like that so much. So then I changed to physiology and then realized all of a sudden that I really like neuroscience. So I ended up majoring in neuroscience, um, bit out of left field compared to the other stuff that I was doing, but really liked it, kept going with it. And then I had one subject that I did. So in the, again, the final year of my studies, all about reproductive biology. And it absolutely blew my mind everything in it was just so new and so cool to me which set me on my path down to become a reproductive biologist so so after that after i'd graduated as technically a neuroscientist major i did a um, graduate diploma in reproductive sciences at monash and then after that um i still found it super interesting which is a good sign and ended up doing um a phd in reproductive biology so i, I stuck to my guns in the end wow uh, vet turned physiologist turned uh, what else was in there a lot (laughs) yeah anatomist neuroscientist reproductive biologist yeah lots of lots of uh mind changing but i got there in the end (laughs) five changes awesome and then so you did your phd in reproductive biology and what were you researching there Um, Well, that was also something that had changed uh, a couple of times as well, which any sort of researcher or or PhD master's student will will also understand, you know, what you set out to do is a lot different to what you end up doing. But 
I originally wanted to work with wombats and do surrogacy um, in an endangered species of wombat, use a, a non-endangered species and use them as a surrogate for the endangered species. But for a couple of reasons that that didn't really go ahead, but I ended up working with um, this incredible animal called the Egyptian spiny mouse. The Egyptian spiny mouse, also known as the Cairo or Arabian spiny mouse, is a nocturnal species of rodent found in northern Africa where it lives in rocky areas and crazy hot deserts, frolicking amongst the cacti. Maybe that's where it got its name, spiny mouse. I don't know. But I do know that these mice are crazy cute. So why are we studying them in laboratories in Australia? Well, let's hear it from the doctor himself. They had um, very recently, I think within a couple of months of me starting, <coughs> had discovered that the Egyptian spiny mouse has a menstrual cycle, which is um, incredibly rare in nature. It's less than 2% of all mammals um, actually have a menstrual cycle. So there's the first fact of today. Um, it's very, very rare. And um, so I wanted to sort of explore that a little bit more. So I looked at sort of the early stages of their pregnancy um, and how the embryo implants and when it implants and how that compares to other species of mice because it is a mouse, um, which I should also say is debatable. <laughs> it's actually more related to a gerbil than it is a mouse, so maybe Somewhere down the line, it might be the spiny gerbil, who knows? So apparently, even though the spiny mouse resembles a mouse, genetically, they appear to be more closely related to gerbils. So which is it? Well, for now, we're just gonna keep telling it like it looks. This mouse-looking gerbil cousin is still a spiny mouse. Um, but yeah, where it sort of lies, um, is it closer to the to a mouse gerbil or is it closer to the human's um, side of reproduction? So I sort of wanted to understand that a little bit more and, and, and tease apart some of the, the kind of fundamental aspects of its reproduction, um, which being a very new animal model, um, uh, we, very, we, we didn't know a lot. Um, so we were sort of coming in blind to a lot of this, um, which was very good for me because I had a lot to do. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I teased apart a little bit of that and um, set up a couple of different protocols for hopefully researchers in the, in, the, in the future. That is awesome. And I actually, I know a little bit about this research because you were working in the laboratory of my colleague, Nadia Bellafiore, who actually, I'm not sure if I can say this, but I believe she was the one that discovered that the spiny mice actually have a period, which is super rare. Why is the menstrual cycle so rare amongst mammals. Can you speak to that at all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a really, really big hurdle in studying menstruation and, and gynecological female health, women's health um, disorders or issues because menstruation is so rare. And a lot of the ways that we use animal models in research is, well, we use them because they're similar in some sort of way that could be They've got the same genes and they are regulated the same way. Whereas menstruation being so rare, we don't really have accessible animal models to study that. Um, and by accessible, I mean a few things. So that can mean um, cost. Um, so I did say that a few animals do still menstruate other than us. So less than 2% of mammals do, and which equates to about 80, 90, something like that. Um, but primarily, they're gorillas, chimpanzees, um, the, the, the big apes that we think of, all the animals that are very, very closely related to us. Um, and there are a couple of odd species out there as well, like bats um, also have a menstrual cycle. Bats have periods? Who knew? So I looked this up, and according to Vagina Museum on Twitter, the fulvus fruit bat has a menstrual cycle that lasts for 33 days, but they only bleed for one day during that time. Also, bats are spooky, so there's many reasons why we can't really use them as an animal model for studying menstruation. But while they do have one, it's actually not human-like. Like, they do have one, but it's actually quite different. So you can study it in some ways, um, but it's not the best model and we always want to find the best. So the best model would be obviously a human, 
but the next best bet would be a gorilla or a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a baboon. And you can imagine the trials and tribulations associated with studying the menstrual cycle of a gorilla um, in captivity. Uh, it comes with a lot of risks. It comes with a lot of concerns, a lot of ethical concerns, a lot of cost as well. So they're not really an accessible animal model um, for us to study those things, um, which makes it, which basically rules them out. You know, there, there have been studies and they've been incredible, um, but they were a long time ago um, when we didn't really have as good an understanding and appreciation for things like ethics, um, whereas now we do. Thank God for that. Um, so we don't really have a great accessible model. And a lot of <clears throat> these things that we do research health-wise, we can look to things, uh, animals like mice or rats. Um, who share a lot of our genes and a lot of how they're regulated and expressed um, is shared between us and mice. But of course, mice don't actually have a menstrual cycle. They've got um, an estrus cycle, which is a little bit different, which I can explain later. He will explain this later, but this word keeps coming up. So I just want to quickly cover it now. Estrus, spelled E-S-T-R-O-U-S, comes from the Latin word oestrus, meaning frenzy. And the estrus cycle is what most mammals go through instead of the menstrual cycle. And it's more for seasonal mating, like when dogs are in heat, or when farm animals just start mounting one another every chance they get. That's because it's mating season for them. So yeah, that's the estrus cycle. So really, we're kind of plucking at straws, plucking at hairs on, on, on how we can study these things. It's, it's, it's just such a difficult thing to study because we don't have a way to study it outside of using humans. Um, and very few, I, I don't think I know anybody that has a menstrual cycle that has ever signed up for some sort of research or, or clinical trial um, because it's just, it's just too much. So we're, we're left with this huge mountain of work and uh, this huge trough of a uh, lack of understanding. Um, and that's really hindered on how much we know and how much we can know. Um, but then in comes the spiny mouse to change all of that so uh yeah. saving the day <clears throat> saving the day they just came in absolute superheroes and you were right in, in saying earlier that uh dr nadia bellafure who did actually discover that exactly that um they have a menstrual cycle so it's incredible that she did so lucky that she did and it's one of those accidental discoveries as well of science that has you know is going to have momentous um benefits or effects to society um, but yeah it was completely by accident so thank god she made this accidental discovery because you know now we've got this small accessible cheap animal model of human menstruation right at our fingertips that we can use um, so it's incredible awesome great work nadia and great work jared for getting involved and setting up some of those protocols that i'm sure are still being used today to investigate this model um can you Tell us a bit more about how it does relate to the human menstrual cycle in terms of uh, what have we learned? Or maybe do you know what we've been able to learn from looking at spiny mice and how that's related to humans? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've learned a lot in, in quite a short amount of time. So this discovery was only made in, I believe, 2017, 20, uh, circa 2017, about five years ago. What we've sort of proven in those sort of five-ish years um, is that a lot of these characteristics that spiny mice, uh, spiny mice um, share, they, they share a lot of characteristics with the human menstrual cycle. So the human menstru uh, menstrual cycle is cyclical, meaning it happens roughly every 28, 30 days, can be more, can be less. Um, but for the sake of this argument, I'll say every 30 days, um, that menstrual cycle, um, that, that's one cycle. So there'll be roughly three weeks of um, growing eggs, growing the uterus, and then if nothing sort of happens, if a pregnancy doesn't happen, um, then you have that one week-ish um, of a menstrual period. And while the spiny mouse menstrual cycle isn't 30 days long, it does mimic those exact periods of growth. So it's got that um, follicular growth phase where the, where the eggs are growing, they're ovulated, and then the uterus um, grows and differentiates, um, gets ready for the pregnancy, and if there is no pregnancy, um, then a menstrual period will, will, will occur. So that's identical 
and being a mouse, everything is a little bit shorter, a little bit quicker. So their whole cycle um, is roughly, uh, roughly nine days. Um, so 30 to nine, time is different, but everything happens within the same window. So time-wise, um, everything is, is pretty much uh, identical if you just sort of condensed it down. And we've also noticed that a lot of the proteins and a lot of the enzymes and things that the uterus secretes um, and, and gets sort of the way it prepares itself for pregnancy is very much the same um, as humans as well. I will also say that Nadia did, did an incredible amount of work, um, uh, behavioral uh, studies as well, um, across the menstrual cycle. So this is a very common thing that people with a menstrual cycle experience. Their, their mood and their behavior fluctuates all throughout their menstrual cycle. Just as their hormones um, change, their mood and behavior fluctuates exactly sort of in tandem with that. And, and you can see that in spiny mice? You absolutely can, yeah. So one of the big terms that everybody uh, refers to as PMS or premenstrual syndrome. So right before you're about to menstruate or have your period, um, you often get a lot of these symptoms of PMS, like um, irritability, um, you're stressed, you eat a lot more. A lot of what human people that have a menstrual cycle experience in, uh, during PMS is actually also mimicked in spiny mice. And... One of the ways um, to test irritability, for example, um, is essentially the difficulty in handling. So how hard it is to pick the mouse up, um, really. And if they're sort of in the early stages of their, of their cycle, it's pretty easy. You know, they might run around a little bit, try to avoid you, kind of normal mouse behavior. Um, but once they're sort of in that window, um, PMS kind of window, um, they're a lot harder to catch. They're a lot harder to handle. They might squirm a lot more. Um, so that is directly correlated with where they are on their menstrual cycle, which is crazy. Wow. I can just imagine a scientist having a little score sheet of one to 10 of how pissed off this mouse is that, that I'm trying to hold it. It sounds stupid, but it's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Sometimes the best science is the simple science, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are a couple of other things, yeah, like, like they were um, more shy or, um, yeah, less confident, a bit more stressed. And the way that you test that in, in mice or it's correlated with this test is um, through exploratory behavior. So what you can do is you can put them in a maze um, and it's, um, you know, got like the classic, you know, cheese at the end sort of scenario, right? Like the mouse has got to walk around and try and find the cheese. Um, and again, sort of outside of that PMS window, there's a quite a bit of exploratory behavior. They're okay to sort of walk around, you know, there might be a little bit of fear, um, there, but once you sort of hit that PMS window, um, that changes again. So they are a lot less exploratory. Um, so they, they, they sort of tend to sit at the back and sort of just, um, not want to walk around because they're having a bad time, <laughs> right? Like it, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, get me out of this maze. Just give me the cheese. Exactly. They're like, what are we doing here? Where's the chocolate? Where's the cheese? That sort of thing. So, um, and I guess on that, um, they ate more. So it, that one's quite a simple one to test, you know, weigh them, um, each day and, and, and weigh the amount of food that they put it, that you put in and take out. So, um, yeah, they ate more, um, during that PMS kind of sort of period as well. So a lot of translatability, which is, it's a little bit spooky, but it's also incredible because that means we can study so much um not just the physiology that's happening but also the, how that works behaviorally too so there's just so much promise um with the spiny mice and hopefully hopefully them um, you know it, it, it keeps showing us more of these amazing things that it's got to offer so reproductive biologists like jared are able to use the spiny mouse as an animal model to study the menstrual cycle Switching our focus to the human menstrual cycle, I asked Jared to kind of explain it and highlight which point during the cycle offers the highest chance of pregnancy. Um, well, you can really only get pregnant in the second half um, of the menstrual cycle. So um, as like a real quick sort of sex ed on what, how a menstrual cycle is like broken down phase by phase is firstly, you have this period of um, egg growth. So the eggs actually start off very, very, very small. And then when you're 
<clears throat> when your menstrual cycle starts or after your last period, um, your eggs will eventually grow and grow and grow um, until one, maybe two um, are selected, um, have matured enough and grown enough for them to ovulate. At the same time, the uterus is also growing. So the, the eggs are growing and the, and the lining of the uterus is growing. Endometrial lining, is that right? Yes, endometrial lining, bingo. <laughs> yes, so that, that is that the, the most superficial, the top layer of the uterus is, is called the endometrium. And that's sort of what um, replicates itself. And, and so it gets thicker and thicker and thicker, ready for that egg um, to then hopefully be fertilized and then implant in. So once the um, egg has grown um, and it's mature, it's at the right stage, it's ovulated, bang, now we're in the second half um, of that menstrual cycle. So we've gone from <clears throat> the follicular phase, which is you know growing the follicle, growing the egg, and now we're into the secretory phase, which means that's when all of those proteins and enzymes and things that I was talking about before, that's when the uterus starts, you know, um, really releasing a lot of these, um, a lot of these factors getting ready. So at this time, yeah, it's, it's secreting a lot of, a lot of different things, but it's also doing something <clears throat> um, that is probably one or two, <laughs> One of the most key or important differences, um, or one of the most key characteristics of a menstrual cycle is that those cells that have replicated um, a ton now terminally differentiate, meaning that they change morphologically and secretorily um, in a way that they can't go back. So they've changed to a point where it's, it's do or die, essentially. It's we are either getting ready and we are bringing in this embryo and getting pregnant, or I'm dying. So that's pretty much what happens. And that is called um, spontaneous decidualization as a uh, fun word to say. So this is another word that keeps coming up a lot. Decidualization is basically when the cells in the endometrium, so the lining of the uterus, they change in preparation for pregnancy. In menstruating animals like humans and spiny mice, this happens spontaneously in response to hormonal changes. So spontaneous decidualization is unique to menstruating mammals. What happens if that embryo is ready to implant? You know, it's, um, it's also secreting a lot of different factors as well. So you've got um, this crosstalk between the uterus and the embryo and they're talking, they're talking, are you ready, are you ready? And then eventually if they both are ready, the embryo will implant. And if the embryo is not ready or the uterus is not ready, or there's some sort of disorder going on there, or there's no embryo at all, the lining, the endometrium, uh, will shed. So it'll get rid of itself. Um, and that is uh, what will exactly eventually lead straight into a period. And that's what a period is. It's that shedding of the uterine lining of that endometrium. So no pregnancy, those do or die cells, there's nothing really happening. So they get rid of, and then that's sort of what your period is. And all of those cells that built up and differentiated, they're all gone and they're ready to start again for the next cycle, essentially. So while those cells are all replicated and they've changed, they've differentiated, that's really the only time that you can actually get pregnant. Um, <clears throat> so you've got kind of a, a couple of days or maybe a, maybe a week or so after you've ovulated that window. And then if nothing really happens, see you later endometrium. <laughs> right. Okay. So in those days leading up to the period is really the highest chance of pregnancy occurring. Do you know much about birth control? Like the, the, the birth control pill, for example, is that something that's considered unhealthy? I mean, obviously it's healthy in terms of if you're trying to prevent a pregnancy, but is, can it be unhealthy in other ways? Um, there are very interesting controversial area so because they come with so many side effects and this sort of goes back to what i was saying at the beginning how we've got this enormous mountain in front of us of trying to understand female health um, and this trough of lack of understanding that we've been using the same birth control pills for you know decades um, and they they work quite effectively really effectively um, in preventing a pregnancy because they either prevent the egg from being ovulated, no egg, no embryo, makes sense. Um, they can prevent the, and this is what we're talking like homo hormonal contraceptives here. So um, it, ones that will either contain estrogens or progesterones or different versions of those or combination of both. So yeah, you can prevent the egg from ovulating. 
Um, you can prevent the um, uterus from um, growing and differentiating to that point where the embryo can, can implant. That works really, really well if it's taken regularly. So those hormones are at those really high levels to prevent those things from happening. But of course, with having such high hormonal levels, that can impact a million other things. Um, and this is why a lot of people during their cycle, while their while their hormones are going up and down like this, so is their behaviour, so is so is their mood, and 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 things like that. So they do have a lot of side effects, um, which are awful. And you know, there's a lot of research going underway to try and prevent or, or reduce the impact of those um, side effects. Hormonal birth control, also known as the pill, can have many side effects, including nausea, breast pain, headaches bloating, weight gain, mood swings, high blood pressure, vaginal bleeding, reduced sex drive, excessive hair growth, and in rare cases, it can increase the risk of blood clots and some cancers. And I'm sure there are some other side effects that I've missed here. So if you're taking birth control and struggling with any of these side effects, please see a gynecologist. They may be able to help you. And there's also the non-hormonal um, contraceptives as well. Um, so uh, a copper intrauterine device, for example, sort of looks like a tree or like a y, a y shape. And that essentially makes it in a hostile environment for, for, the, for the sperm, for the egg and for the embryo. So there's no hormones involved, but it's, it, it's hostile and that fertilization and implantation won't take place. But it's not as effective as the hormonal ones, is, is my understanding. And I've heard that it's extremely painful. And it, it can be, and this, is, and this is exactly one of the problems. So it, sh it shouldn't be painful in that. And what I mean by that is if it is going to be painful to put in, then you shouldn't be getting it put in without sedation. But doctors and people just sort of put up with it and put up with that pain just because that's just the easiest route. And, you know, if it is painful, you shouldn't be awake for it. You should be, uh, you should be under anesthetic. So a lot of people can have it um, completely fine, completely painless with no anesthetic at all, but not everyone's the same. Not everyone is identical. Everybody's got a different cervix. So it can be painful for some, can be very um, easy cruisy for, for others, but it shouldn't be painful is, is sort of the point, is what a gynecologist would, would say anyway. <laughs> you mentioned before the estrus cycle. Can you touch quickly on what exactly is the estrus cycle and do... I have one. Do you have one? Do humans have one? <laughs> uh, yes, great question. The estrus cycle is sort of the counter evolutionary strategy that mammals have to a menstrual cycle. And if only 2% have a menstrual cycle, clearly an estrus cycle is kind of the way to go, right? If, every, if everyone's got one, um, then it, it's, it, it, seems, it must work pretty damn well. You think of a lot of animals, let's go like cows or, or goats or really any, any, any animal, <laughs> most animals that you can think of have some sort of breeding season. So, you know, they, they mate in one season, um, they'll give birth in another one a couple of months later, however long it is. Um, and that is a very key characteristic of an estrus cycle. It's, it's seasonal. So it sort of shuts down, their reproduction shuts down for a period of the year, and then it kind of ramps up again um, you know, but, but by kind of autumn or like after winter, I should say spring, sorry, um, when time is right, you know, the, the sun's coming out, there's more food, there's more water, there's access to all of these things that make it more suitable time to breed. And what sort of governs that is often it's sunlight. So it's called the photo period. And essentially what it is, is the amount of light that comes through our eyes and hits our retinas then affects um, how an enzyme or a protein called melatonin um, impacts or affects our reproduction. So if you can sort of increase the amount of daylight or decrease the amount of daylight, it's going to change how much melatonin is affecting our reproduction. And that can essentially turn on and shut off the estrus cycle of these animals. So more daylight, you, it's all of a sudden going to sort of ramp back up again um, because it's changed that melatonin pathway, which is really interesting. Imagine if humans had an estrus cycle instead of a menstrual cycle. There would be no monthly period, there would be less of a need for birth control, and all children would be born around the same time. So everybody would have roughly the same birthday, and we could all just have one massive communal birthday party every year. Ah, if only. So we have a, a cyclical menstrual cycle every month, 
for the rest of you know your reproductive years it doesn't matter if it's rain hail or shine doesn't matter what season it is doesn't really no matter how much food and water and all of that doesn't doesn't matter any of that i say it doesn't matter at all it might happen in very extreme circumstances whereas you know very overweight or very underweight people it can it can impact your menstrual cycle then but most for most people and the vast majority of people or vast majority of people and animals with menstrual cycles it doesn't have any effect that's super interesting and so if the estrus cycle is so common throughout the animal kingdom why has the menstrual cycle evolved and why are we stuck with it why are humans part of the two percent that have the seemingly inefficient reproductive system <laughs> that's the age-old question and one that we're still trying to find the best answer to we've got a couple of theories um but it's very very hard to sort of nail down or pick which one makes sense because they both sort of make sense in, in some situations and for some species um you know the menstrual cycle of humans is very different to that of bats so you know, did they evolve in the same way? Do these things, you know, you know, we've we've still got some questions, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll stop, you know, blabbering and try and get an answer. <laughs> it could just be that I'm sure there's more to it, but sometimes we just evolve in a certain way. Evolution is not perfect, right? It just it's enough to help us survive. Evolution is not perfect, exactly, exactly. It works, so it stays around for a while, and then something better comes along, and it sort of veers off over there. That term that I mentioned before, spontaneous decidualization, is a key contributor to what a period is. So if you don't decidualize, your cells don't decidualize, you've got nothing to shed, essentially. So it's kind of a case of chicken or the egg. Which came first? Did the cells decidualize first, or did they sort of get shed first and realize that maybe this pattern is, is more efficient of build up and get rid of it, build up and get rid of it, rather than with an estrus cycle where it can just sort of stay built up, not completely built up, but stay about half built up for its whole reproductive time. Maybe that's actually more efficient to sort of build it, get rid of it, um, than it is to maintain. Um, so it's kind of like an energy, conservation of energy um, theory that might have some weight to it because it is quite cyclical. Um, and it is um, less energy intensive, but at the same time, it is very energy intensive. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a maybe for me. <laughs> and another interesting one that a lot of people don't like when I hear it is uh, when I say it is that the animals that have a menstrual cycle, um, actually, if you think about them in the wild, so, you know, like gorillas and orangutans and baboons and things like that, um, they don't have any predators. There's no actual kind of top of the food chain predator that's after them. You know, who's going to take on a gorilla? Like insane. Who's going to take on an orangutan? They're up the top of the trees, you know, all of these things. So in a very weird way, I, I, it, we're kind of, um, we can afford to have a menstrual cycle. So it's very energy intensive in one way and also energy preserving in one way. But if we can afford to expend all of this energy building and shedding and building and shedding um then we're lucky we're lucky to have one um which i'm sure anybody listening that has a menstrual cycle is ready to like tear my <laughs> tear my throat out but um that's one sort of theory i guess um is that these top of the food chain animals have been able to have been lucky enough or, or fortunate enough to evolve this mechanism um, may not be the nicest behaviorally, but energetically it might be, you know. Um, which then begs the question, why in the world did a spiny mouse, a tiny little mouse from the, the deserts of Egypt, um, evolve to have a menstrual cycle? This animal that's a prey to just about anything you could imagine, snakes and foxes and um, eagles or whatever else, you know, predator lives in Egypt. You know, why is this tiny little mouse developed a menstrual cycle you know it's leading a bloody trail quite literally wherever it goes it doesn't make sense jared did mention that it's possible that the egyptian spiny mice may have only recently evolved their menstrual cycle since being in captivity see nobody has ever actually checked whether or not they have appeared in the wild so if you're listening from egypt if you could just go out into the desert and check on some wild spiny mice for us that'd be awesome can i 
just ask for a second, and I probably should ask you this at the start. I imagine you get this question a lot. You are a cis white male. <laughs> yes, I am. What, <laughs> what inspired you to, to focus your research or get into studying specifically the female reproductive system? I think it was a, a sheer lack of understanding <laughs> um, for, for me. I just, it was just so new and so fascinating. And there's so much going on that I personally didn't know about. And, you know, scientifically, we still don't know a heck of a lot, which I think I've communicated a bit today already. Um, it was just so interesting that we know so little about something that, you know, roughly half the planet have and go through every month for the rest of their reproductive years. It, it was just so interesting to me that, that, my, that I and so many of my friends and, you know, family members also know so little about. So it's, it's kind of been this process where I've learned so much personally and so much professionally as well that I found it just so rewarding to, to learn so much about this field and, and equally to, to, teak, uh, to teach about it and, and to talk to other people about it. Because, you know, if, if you've got a menstrual cycle for, yeah, every month for the, all of your reproductive years and you don't really know how it works or what it is, um, it's really important for you to know. I think you should know. And this is why I, I go and mansplain things like this to everybody all over the place. Um, <laughs> it's kind of important. It's very, very important. So, you know, hopefully people have learned a little bit today and there's a couple of buzzwords I'm sure people have got uh, memorized now already. Spontaneous decidualization. There you go. That's, that's a take home. That, that's a take home. It was fascinating to me and I love, you know, other people learning about their bodies. I think it's just really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. And your work is great. I'm so glad that you've done so much. And now you're switched into more of a science communicator role. So you are sharing this knowledge. And I'm going to tell people about your blog. Dr. Jared McKenna has an incredible website called thesimplescience.com, where he is making the complex casual. His writing is nothing short of genius. Definitely check it out. And just to give you a taste, some of his blog posts include titles such as Wormholes, the Ubers of the Universe, what good is a menstruating mouse? And of course, fantastic phalluses and where to find them. Are there any book or movie recommendations that people could check out if they're interested in, in this sort of stuff? There are, uh, there are actually a couple. Um, there's one, you know, being the reproductive biologist that I am, I follow a couple of gynecologists and obstetricians on TikTok and Twitter and all of that. Um, so as a, an amazing professional and really great resource um, for accurate and reliable um, information in the whole female women's health space. I would encourage everybody here that's listening to follow Dr. Jen Gunter, G-U-N-T-E-R. Um, she's incredible. She debunks a whole bunch of stuff. She's a very strong av um, advocate for women and females' rights and health, and it's incredible. She's incredible. Um, and she's written two amazing books that I haven't read yet, but I've got to, obviously. Um, one is called um, The Vagina Bible, and it's all about every, basically a lot of what I've spoken about today, um, debunking a lot of myths, basic, you know, fundamental understanding of these things and why they are, why they are, and wh why, they are, wh where they, why they are, where they are, and things like that. Very, very cool. I can imagine so many, so many guys picking that book up, <laughs> expecting something completely different. Very and, different. Uh, being... Yeah. Maybe initially let down, but I feel like there's a lot of valuable information in there that guys would need to know anyway. So, uh, the Vagina Bible. And then she's got another one called the, uh, the Menopause Manifesto, which, of course, has a ton of information about menopause and perimenopause and postmenopause. Um, and again, you know, what it is, why we go through it, and what it means for you, things like that. So, Dr. Jen uh, Gunter, you know, big fan, big fan. Um, <clears throat> but even more sort of colloquially, um, is I, I love the show Big Mouth. I think a lot of people have watched or heard of Big Mouth before. Big Mouth is so funny and informative. That's a great show. I wish that was around when I was a teenager. Exactly. It's so informative, but it's so colloquial and, and, and funny and informative and um, relatable. You know, it, it's, it's amazing. They cover a lot of different topics. You know, uh, some of it, or well, a lot of it, um, is reproductive-based, of course. Um, 
So there's, you know, there's the coming of age, getting your first period, what a period is, you know, the same sort of thing on the male side of things, you know, how does sperm grow and how babies are made and pregnancy and all of that. So as a more sort of colloquial take, Big Mouth, I've got to recommend it, you know, hands down. So the two ends, you've got, yeah, got, got Dr. Dr. Gunter, who's the very, you know, official professional um, a resource. And then you've got Big Mouth, which is also, you know, well substantiated and well resourced but in a more colloquial, fun way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, those are great recommendations. I haven't heard of Dr. Jane Gunter, but I will have to check that out. Just as a random sort of question, and, and then I've got a few listener questions before we finish up. Uh, if you could do something completely different with your life, if you decided not to get into reproductive biology or, or maybe not even science, what else would you have done? Ooh, I mean, if I stayed within science, I would have become a vet. That's like... That's, you know, I still sort of love that field. It's great. <laughs> if it wasn't out, if it's outside of science, uh, chef, <laughs> hands down, hands down. Love cooking, love, oh, love baking. I would be, I would be a pastry chef specifically. Um, and that's, I guess, got a little bit of science sort of like woven in there, you know, very specific quantities of things. You got to follow the method very um, methodically. Um, whereas cooking can see a, be a bit more kind of, you know, a little bit, bit of this, bit of that, taste, how's it, how's it going, add a little bit more, whereas baking is, baking's a science. <laughs> I guess but, you can't get the science out of this man. <laughs> I, I can't, yeah, I can't. So, I mean, yeah, pastry chef is probably where I'd end up. I like to think that if Jared had become a baker, he'd be one of those bakers that specialises in erotic cakes that are shaped like genitals. Maybe he already does that. I don't know, I didn't ask. But either way, it seems whichever path Jared chose in life, he would always end up doing something involving the reproductive system and baking. Uh, I've got a few listener questions here, if you're ready for them. But before that, every week here on Travelling Science, we donate to a charity of the guests choosing. And this week, Dr. Jared McKenna has decided to donate to Endo Australia, which provides funding for education and research into endometriosis, a serious condition which affects one in every nine women, and it's not a fun time. So a donation has been made to the Endo Australia Foundation, and you can donate to them as well if you'd like to, or if you'd like to support this show and the donations that we make every single week, funding science to make the world a better place, you can find The Travelling Scientist on Patreon. And both of those links are in the show notes just below. Gabek was wondering, is it true that birth control depletes your body's vitamins? Is that, is that a thing? Do you know anything about that? I uh, don't know anything about that, but I don't think it would. Um, and if it did, it would be very temporary, uh, you know. These are very well-researched tools that we use. Um, so it may explain, you know, things like some of the some of the side effects that we are experiencing. But I don't I probably don't know enough about it. That's definitely something to take up with your with your gynecologist. I would say GP, um, but I always encourage people to go to a gynecologist if they can afford it because they are the experts. You know, a lot of information can get muddled. Um, GPs are a great resource, um, but you know, the gold standard would be to go and talk to your gynecologist about it. Awesome. Great. Carly Ellen was wondering if there's a best contraception for women. Is, is there a best one out there or, or are they, they're all their pros and cons? There's never a one size fits all. Just in any healthcare situation, you can never really suggest one for everyone. Um, everybody is different. It depends on you. Um, you know, if you're great with routine, you know, something like a contraceptive pill, whether that is an estrogen based one, a progesterone based one or both, that's totally up to you, you know, trialing which one works symptom wise for you. Um, but yes, if you're very methodical, then a pill might really work. If you're less so, um, then uh, the Marina, which is an IUD, so there's intra intrauterine devices. Um, they're called, they're also got another name, a long acting reversible contraceptive, a LARC. So essentially you've put the um, IUD in and five years of contraception done. You know, you don't need to do anything. Um, once it's in, you sort of sit back and it'll do its thing for five years. Um, and then you get, get it taken out and put another one in after five years. And they're what, 97, eight, nine percent effective, something, something incredibly high. Um, at preventing pregnancy, so. According to marina.com, spelt M-I-R-E-N-A, 
the IUD is 99% effective, meaning that in one year of regular intercourse, whatever that is, out of 100 women with the IUD, one would get pregnant. Not perfect, but pretty damn good in terms of birth control. I would recommend the Marina, the, uh, the hormonal IUD. Um, but again, there's no real one size fits all for everyone. It's another conversation to have with someone like your GP or gynecologist. Yeah, absolutely. Science Way was wondering, is there a relationship between hormonal changes and mood swings? And I think we touched on this before. There definitely, definitely is. <laughs> um, and a lot of people that have a menstrual cycle will definitely say this is what they experience. Whether they have actually noticed it or not um, is a different thing. So once you sort of talk to someone about this sort of area, um, they actually start to sort of prick their ears up a bit or, or be like, hang on, actually, that's kind of true. You know, like I am more moody towards the end of my cycle where I've got less estrogen and more progesterone. Um, or, you know, I'm more productive, you know, after my period because I've got more estrogen and less progesterone. So they are very, very tightly um, woven together, your sort of hormones and your behavior. Um, absolutely. And, and like I said, sort of across this chat a couple of times, they f it fluctuates all throughout the cycle. So they're very tightly linked. If one goes up, then another one will go, go up or go down. So yeah, definitely a correlation there. And Vegan Honey has, I believe, seen your talk, Fantastic Phalluses and Where to Find Them. And she wanted me to ask you, which animal has the largest penis to body size ratio? Well, great question. Well, the answer is, it might be very, very surprising, um, but it's actually the barnacle. The barnacle. So those barnacles that attach to whales and boats and they're about the size of like your pinky nail. Um, those things that you see on reefs and all of that, those tiny, tiny little things, um, largest, longest penis to body size ratio of any animal on the planet. So it's one to nine. Um, so it's if, if it's a centimeter long barnacle, it's got a nine centimeter long penis. Wow. So, <laughs> so a blue whale, for example, has the largest penis full stop. You know, it's three, three meters, three and a half meters. But a blue whale is enormous. Um, you know, they're about, what, I think 20 odd meters. So it's, it's a, you know, a bit less than 10% of its body length. If it was nine times its body length, it would be as tall as a 40 story building. So that's a very big penis, but yes, thankfully that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, the barnacle, go, go barnacles. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you for answering those listener questions. All right, Jared, and are you ready for the lightning round? All right, hit me. Alrighty, uh, what's your go-to choice for caffeine? For caffeine? Oh, cappuccino. Cappuccino, nice. Uh, do you take any supplements? Uh, no supplements, actually. None. Who needs them? If you've got a healthy diet, you don't need them. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite place to travel in the world? Oh, favorite place to travel to? Oh my God, so many, that's impossible. <laughs> um, at the moment, I'm craving just Europe in general. Haven't been there in so many years. I've, I've, I'm really craving to be back. I grew up in Asia, so lots of Asia I've done, but Europe is my calling right now. Oh, nice, very cool. Do you practice any meditation or mindfulness, anything like that? I'm starting to, I'm starting to, yeah. Baths are definitely my thing, you know. Get the bath bomb, the candles, the book, that whole thing. That's definitely a mindfulness activity I'm trying to lean into a lot more and would encourage, encourage others to. Oh, absolutely. I wish I had a bath in my house. Very lucky I've got, I've got one. <laughs> nice. Um, do you have, uh, I noticed you've talked a bit about animals. Obviously, you wanted to be a veterinarian, so you, you love animals. Do you have a favorite animal? Favorite animal, uh, well, of course, the animals that I have are my favorite animals. I can't not, you know, you know, give them a shout out. Um, I've got uh, Franklin, my Australian Shepherd dog, two years old. I've got uh, Gandalf, who's my um, eight-year-old cat. I've got Willow, who's my seven, six, uh, seven, six-year-old cat. Um, and Lola Peach, who is our three-year-old uh, snake. Um, but one of my favorite animals has, has just got to be any species of penguin. I think they're just hilarious. <laughs> penguins nice and uh just because of your uh recent talk that i saw at pine of science uh, this is gonna be a weird question what is your favorite animal penis my favorite animal penis i've got to go echidna it's just the it's just something so out there the four-headed penis it's got two on the left and two on the right and it only uses two at a time as well so it's it's very weird and it's very 
interesting, I would say, to look at. So it's definitely my favorite. So I had to look this up, and the echidna penis, wow. It looks kind of like the giant space slug from Star Wars, you know, the Exegorth, but if it had four heads, and also it's not giant, it's tiny, obviously, but bizarre and worth looking up if you want to absolutely ruin your Google search history and potentially get some weird advertisement suggestions in the near future. What do you love about science? The, 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 the finding out of something completely new or you've got something that you really want to explore and you have the ability to sort of probe away at it uh, whether that's you know small or big steps you know finding out something new or finding a solution for something a treatment for something a cure why something is the way it is it's just this innate problem solving um characteristic of science is you know it's it's curiosity and it's 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 solving problems and i think that's just so so fun and so rewarding as well once you do get those answers hopefully you do get those answers but once you do they're great <laughs> yeah absolutely uh what about your least favorite thing what do you is there anything you hate about science oh it takes forever <laughs> everything everything takes a long long time it does <laughs> even just to find out some of those more basic um, basic things like what I did, you know, finding out, do they have the same type of estrogen that humans do? Um, it takes a long time and a lot of money and, um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of power, like, like manpower to, to figure those things out. So it's a long road. Um, but once you get there, it is very, very rewarding and it's very worth it. Yeah. Uh, that's a great answer, Jared McKenna. Uh, considering everything we've discussed here today, do you have one key bit of advice that you offer to listeners that could, they could take home to help improve their lives in some way? Yeah, I mean, it would be to definitely find out more about your body. I mean, it could be something really basic, like, you know, I say, I, I say that a menstrual cycle is quite a basic understanding, but it's, it's actually a very complicated thing that's happening. But if you can even just learn a little bit about those those more fundamental things that, that go on in your body and how you live and work and how things affect you. Um, and it doesn't have to be your menstrual cycle. It could be something far more, far more, far different than, than what that is, you know, just finding out how your body works. So there you have it, legends. That was science communicator and reproductive biologist, Dr. Jared McKenna. And if you want, you can follow Jared on Twitter at it's Dr. Mac. That's I-T-S underscore D-R-M-A-C. And I would highly recommend his blog, which can be found at thesimplescience.com. But before we finish the show, I just want to reiterate his last point, which was get to know your body. Enjoy your body. Use it every way that you can. Don't be afraid of it or what other people might think of it. It's the greatest instrument that you'll ever own. Did I just quote the sunscreen song? Yes, I did. But Baz Luhrmann and Dr. Jared McKenna both make a great point. We need to understand our bodies. What happens when you don't get enough sleep? What foods does your body like? How does caffeine affect you? How do your hormone levels fluctuate? And how does that make you feel? It's really helpful to know this stuff. And it's important to check in with yourself regularly. How do you feel? No, no, how do you really feel? Think about it. And if there's anything that you don't understand about your body, do some research, ask people questions, and listen to podcasts, including this one. Speaking of this one, thanks so much for listening to this episode today, Legends. And if you haven't already, subscribe to Traveling Science and leave me a review. I'd really appreciate it. Also, follow Traveling Science on Instagram and The Traveling Scientist on YouTube. Finally, if you stick around to the end, I always leave you with a little secret. And this week's secret is that, to this day, my favorite movie in the entire world is up have you seen this movie it's like 15 years old now it's a kids movie about an old man and a flying house and there's a kid and a bird and talking dogs and there's action adventure it's funny it's just an incredible movie and doug the talking dog is actually the greatest character that's ever been invented in my opinion and i keep waiting for another movie to come along and replace it as my favorite but it can't be done up is the goat, the greatest of all time, and I challenge anyone to prove me wrong on that. Anyway, thanks so much for listening, Legends. Catch you next Science Sunday. Cheers.